Hello everyone, I'm Alex Camerata. Welcome to another installment of The Basins and Solve. This season is a massive one as we explore everything from a baby being killed hours into its life to a woman who was killed before she was able to have her baby. Tonight we're highlighting four cases and as different as they may be, they all have one thing in common. They are unsolved. Here is Marcus Risen with the second season of The Basins Unsolved. Marcus. Thanks, Alex. This was a huge season for The Basins Unsolved as we explored four incredibly heartbreaking and unsolved mysteries in West Texas. The first case was possibly the most heartbreaking as a baby, just hours old, was found dead in the dumpster. Viewer discretion is advised for this one. Life is a precious thing, and when it's thrown away, it's a tragedy. But when a newborn baby is found dead in a dumpster, it's more than a heartbreaking tragedy. It's murder. This is a story of baby John Doe. This is a case that was one of the very first cases that I was actually ever involved in. Susan Rogers is the CEO of Odessa Crime Stoppers. Crime Stoppers. I'm in my 36th year um, as a director for Crime Stoppers. And one of her first cases was possibly the most heartbreaking. So in July of 1996, the body of a newborn baby boy was found in a dumpster in South Central Odessa. Investigators believe that he had been put in there alive and had been killed after he got into the dumpster. He would um, he had been hit in the head or something and actually lived for a little while in, in that dumpster. An innocent life, hurt and slowly dying as he lies abandoned in a dumpster. His cries heard by some. And there was a lady who had a small child as well. It's the summertime, it's the middle of the night, she's got her windows open, she hears a baby crying, goes to check on her baby, and um, her baby's not crying. So she probably actually heard Baby Doe in the dumpster at some point. Baby Doe's death shocked the community. It was hard to imagine that an innocent baby who didn't even have a name could be thrown away just like trash. I remember so much community um, support back when this happened. Um, number one, it was a, a, an infant, a newborn baby. That tugged at a lot of heartstrings, and, and everybody wanted to know what happened. The main question on everyone's mind is who would kill arguably the most innocent thing in the entire world? You just can't fathom that someone would do that. I mean, I can't, at least, you know, that that I, I can't even imagine, you know, what, what was going through that woman's mind when that happened. I'm, I'm relatively sure that the, the program where you can drop the um, children off at, the infants off at the fire department was not around. I, I don't think that was a program that was, that was even thought of at that time. But still, 27 years later, police still don't know who killed baby John Doe. You know, there's been a lot of theories on this. Was it someone actually from Odessa? It was so close to the interstate. Was it someone that was pregnant and delivered on the interstate and that was the nearest trash can they found? Despite this case being so old, Rogers still believes the case of Baby Doe will be solved through another element that wasn't as prominent back then. There's just so much developing with DNA profiles and stuff. The DNA that we need to solve this case may not be here right now. 10 years from now, that DNA, I mean, it might be 10 years, five years from now, you know, with the advances in DNA and the different things that they're doing um, in genetics, um, all of this, you know, may happen. Even without DNA, tips from the community could provide the answers police are looking for. Baby Doe is probably the only um, cold case that when we run it, someone responds to us. It's not been enough for us to get to a parent, but it, it does get response from the community. I can assure you that baby John Doe, thrown away in that dumpster on a warm summer morning, has not been forgotten. Maybe your tip can be the one that helps Odessa Crime Stoppers finally solve this. If you have information on this case, please call us at 432-333-TIPS. The story of Baby Doe is a devastating one. This baby could have grown up to do great things, but instead, he was killed and thrown away. All we can do now is get justice for the baby with no name. And the way to do that is to help solve the sad and shocking cold case of Baby John Doe. If you have any info about Baby Doe, make sure to contact Odessa Crime Stoppers. Now the next episode of this series was another heartbreaking one, as a loving father was found dead, holding a picture of who he loved. We all came out here looking and looking, but we couldn't find him nowhere. Daniel Flores was a father, a grandfather, and a husband, and he would do anything for his family. Daniel was a good person. He was good to anybody and everybody. 10 years ago, however, Flores was found dead, holding a picture of who he loved. He was holding a picture of the three boys. You could tell that that's what he was looking at when he died. Found dead in his son's car days after he was deemed missing. This is the story of Daniel Flores. I 
how we met is crazy. I was raised here, he was raised across the street. Both raised in Big Spring, Texas. Lou Sherman was once married to Daniel Flores. It just went from there, we wound up dating, and then we wound up getting married. We were married 18 years. We had three kids. A childhood romance turned into a tragedy. My middle son used to live here, and then um, Daniel came in one night and said that some people had beat him up. He told him who did it and what they did, you know, like kicking him in the head, the, the spine, whatever. And he was bleeding. You could tell he'd been fighting back. And my middle son tells him just to lay down, Dad. We'll take care of it tomorrow. I got to be at work at 6 o'clock in the morning. Unfortunately, tomorrow was too late. Flores was missing the next morning. It took us two days to find him. Where they found him was right in front of their house. And he actually died in an old car that him and my middle son was going to redo and make into a lowrider. Right here where we're at, he died right here. Lou's middle son was the one who found him. The picture of him and his siblings still in his father's hands. When he found him, he still had that picture in his hand. He fell over sideways, and he still had that picture in his hand. And Lou claims his murder was over something trivial. And just over a six pack of beer. It's just crazy. Even though it's been a decade since his death, the pain still lingers within this family. I mean, every year it is so hard. My kids struggle just to come over here. It's just too much for them. I'm, and I tell them, I said, we can always do something, you know, do it somewhere else, but they want to do it here where he died. Lou and the family think they know who did it. Despite this, however, the Big Spring Police Department still says it's an open investigation 10 years later. Well, we were told that there wasn't enough blood on the, a hammer or a pair of shoes, stuff that they had used. There wasn't enough blood, wasn't enough evidence on there to use it against the people that did this. They did find a little bit of stuff, but they said there wasn't enough for evidence on there to prove who did what. 10 years is a long time without closure, and this family could really use some. And I know there's people out there that know stuff. I wish they'd just come forward and tell them so that they could get solved and my kids could get closure. You might have all the information the Big Spring Police Department needs to give this family some closure. If they have any information, they can con contact Crime Stoppers. They say there's still a $1,000 reward out there. A reward that Lou hopes can finally give her family some answers. The Big Spring Police Department declined to give me any information about this case. But if you have any information, make sure to call these numbers on your screen. Now going from a man found dead in a car to a woman who was found dead trying to sell her car, this is the story of Janet Gregston. 1984 was a different time. Back in the day, you just put an ad in the newspaper and people would come test drive your vehicle. But on this day, a simple ad in the paper led to a gruesome murder. They surmised that someone came and test drove the vehicle and she got in the car with them and something happened out while they were test driving it and she was killed during that. She wasn't the only one that died in that moment. Her unborn baby also losing their life that hadn't even started. This is the story of Janet Grexton. Janet Gregston was found murdered um, on August 21st of 1984. So she was in the process of selling a car. She had a gold Buick Riviera. We think the perpetrator went over there acting as if he was interested in buying the car. And uh, we believe she willfully got into the car with him to let him test drive the car. And uh, he stabbed her uh, several times uh, before she was able to exit the car. She starts running down the road up onto the loop and he jumps out after her and runs her down and stabs her there on the side of the road. The murderer didn't even take the car. Um, the vehicle was subsequently found in a neighborhood afterwards. You have no idea what the motive is for someone that's gonna kill someone. You know, they just, I mean, it's, some people are just wired wrong. The one thing on this case's side, witnesses. I think there were a couple of uh, witnesses that had been on the uh, loop at that time that had seen a man and a woman arguing in a car. Um, so they had some witnesses at the time. Enough witnesses to create a sketch of the potential killer. We wound up with a drawing, a sketch of the um, suspect. But unfortunately, the drawing led 
to a dead end. I believe back at the time that Composite was actually released, they had some names that had come in, but they'd ruled everybody out on that. So as far as I know, that we've never been able to get anywhere with that. So it was back to square one for investigators, until a few months later, when a man came to the sheriff's office claiming he had extrasensory perception, or ESP, and that he knew Janet was in danger the day of her death, stating he had visions of harm, giving investigators details about the crime only the killer would know. An eyewitness then confirmed he was the man they saw that fateful day. So an arrest was made, and for a while, investigators seemed to have their man. And that seemed to be that. He was the murderer of Janet Crexton. Right? We took the case to the grand jury. He was found to be incompetent to stand trial. Uh, he was allowed to go to Rusk state mental hospital where I think he was there for a, a year or so. Now he was later found to be competent in January of 1986 and awaited his trial. After six months, his murder case against Janet Gregston was, to the horror of the family, dismissed. It was revealed in a hearing that a key piece of videotaped evidence had been erased accidentally by a sheriff's department deputy. The evidence in question was a 45 minute videotape recording of a hypnosis session with an eyewitness, the one who identified the suspect as the killer. And with that, the accused killer was dismissed due to lack of evidence. And a person who people thought was the killer was released. And uh, next thing I know, he, he was released back into the public. So the case was once again back at square one. And despite this major setback almost 40 years ago, investigators still have a little bit of hope. Janet's is another case that um, I think could be solved. I think it's another one of those cases. I mean, this happened in the broad daylight. Um, if you can think back to 84, um, think back where you were at that time. And, you know, at the time, you probably thought about it, that you drove by that area and you saw something. The police have all the tools to solve this crime, except for a bit of information. This could be your chance to come forward and give closure to a family who's been grieving for nearly 40 years. This includes Janet's widow, who not only lost his wife, but he also lost his baby and what could have been a beautiful family. It's been almost 40 years since the murder of Janet Gregston, which ultimately led to the couple never having the family they wanted. To help solve this one, make sure to contact Odessa Crime Stoppers. Now the final case covered this season on The Basins Unsolved was about how the King of Odessa was taken from his throne. If you lived in Odessa in the 90s, you probably heard the name B.L. King. He was the owner of the Torch Club, which was a strip club here in Odessa over off of Golder. Wealthy and popular, King looked like he was living the life until one fateful day. So B.L. King was murdered in 1996, and they found him uh, shot to death inside of his house. King was found with three gunshots to his torso and head, and that was 26 years ago, and the case is still cold. But Odessa is a small town, and King knew a lot of people. So how could a high-profile case of the King of Odessa go this cold? This is the story of B.L. King. Called flamboyant, generous, good-humored, and lovable by his peers, B.L. King was a very likable guy who always helped people who needed it. He was able to help them due to his obvious wealth. Like he was kind of a flashy guy, always had a lot of money, um, dressed real nice, drove nice cars, that sort of thing. So when he was murdered, police considered robbery as the motive. And, and there were a few things that were missing from the house, but nothing that was so specific that they could actually call it a botched robbery. That's not the only thing that didn't add up to police. There were no signs of forced entry, and money and jewelry were left on King's body making the murder look personal. We learned that BL um, was a very private person when it came to his home life, and so he didn't let a lot of people just walk in his door. If you walked up to his door and knocked on the door, you weren't gonna get in the door. He had to pretty much know who you were. Um, and law enforcement has always thought that it was somebody that he knew, that he would have never just let someone into his house. Someone as popular as King? made for a laundry list of suspects. I know that they did interview um, and identify several people in that investigation, but they were just never able to get, get to who, the, who did it. So who murdered B.L. King? It's a question his family still wants answered. I do know that B.L. King has family members that are still alive and that they need answers. You know, they need to know what happened and it needs to be closed. And after 26 years, this once cold case has new hope.
Hey there, and welcome to the Behind the Line podcast, episode one. So let's kick this off with a case that's remained unsolved for over 25 years. Odessa Crime Stoppers, like the Basins Unsolved, are trying to solve as many cold cases as they can. One of those ways is through a relatively new medium, podcasting. We have a, a deputy that's a coordinator for us from the sheriff's office here in Ector County. His name is Ryan Kelly. We've put a lot of effort and a lot of work, a lot of research into these episodes, and we hope that y'all enjoy them as much as we have. And he said, Odessa Crime Stoppers could do a podcast. We could do our cold cases. And then the wheels just started spinning. And we are making our podcast um, a little different from some of the other ones that you see out there. We're actually interviewing family members. We're interviewing the detectives from back in that day. And we're interviewing um, experts in the field of uh, forensics and some different and some different things so that ours will have a different twist to it. The first episode was released in January featuring B.L. King himself. This case takes place on the evening of November 17th, 1996. In the process seems to be working. We just happened to mention one thing that triggered this person that called us um, uh, memory and made him want to call and talk to us about what, what he remembered. Uh, the Texas Rangers were actually working on this case at one point, so we've gotten them involved with that and gotten the information to them, and they are currently uh, looking into the new information that was received. It goes to show that one new bit of information can be the tipping point for any of these cases. Who knows? Maybe you know something that could close a case. Someone, somewhere, knows something. Maybe one more tip. Yours is all it takes. And we'll see you in the next episode. Perhaps with the help of the internet, the popular BL King's murder can be solved one day, which ultimately is what we want for all of these cases. If you have any information about any of these cases, no matter how small or big, make sure to contact the police or Crime Stoppers and tell them your story. You never know, you could be the difference. Back to you, Alex. Thanks, Marcus. And he's right. The Basins Unsolved's goal is to eventually help law enforcement solve these cases, and we can't do that without you. You can be the difference. All of these cases have been called solvable, but they need a little push, and you can be that push. Who knows, maybe you can make a family member who's been aching for as long as 40 years have some peace. Thank you for watching The Basins Unsolved.